welcome back to another edition of Witch Booktube, where we talk about books that support your witchcraft and your spiritual journey. Today we're going to be talking about a book that I actually sent out in the December 2018 Witches Box. I sent out 26 different books for that box, and this is one of the ones that was included. And it's called Candle Magic by Lady Passion. You see that? It's a beautiful little design. It's small, it's not a thick book. Let me read to you a little bit about the author and then I'll show you the inside of the book and get into all the things about this book. Lady Passion is an experienced blind seer, a registered nurse since 1988, high priestess of coven Oldenwild since 1994, and an internationally best-selling authoress since 2005. The magical specialties are divination, making magical medicines, and conducting elaborate public rituals. Lady Passion's successful spiritual, environmental, and social justice activism is documented online, such as her elimination of North Carolina's anti-divination law, protection of registered nurses from being fired for advocating for patients' rights, saving of centuries-old trees in a public park and an old haunted stone jail beneath them, and much more. The lady counsels folk worldwide and frequently works magic for the media such as Extra, CNN, and BBC London. She lives snugly in her three-story covenstead in the Bowl of Asheville, surrounded by breathtaking Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains. Readers may contact Lady Passion through her coven's popular Wiccan websites, Wiccan.org, I'm sorry, Wiccans.org, Oldenwild.org, and Oldenworks.org. So here's the thing, there's a lot of things. And I'm gonna start with saying that three of her books were included in the box. All of them are highly recommended through Amazon, Gold, uh, Goodreads, and a few other book review sites, which is one of the reasons why I chose the books. But I had a really hard time with them, you guys. So let me show you the things that I liked. I'm a design junkie, beautiful. I thought it was a really lovely book. There is kind of a, a theme in book design, especially in the witchcraft sphere. And they're all really beautiful, but they're all starting to look the same with like the gold leaf and the little flower designs. Like you've seen it, a lot of books are looking like this. And this is a little different. So I, I really appreciate that. It's different, I like it. The pages are made out of almost like a construction paper feel, even though it's not construction paper and I love texture. So I like that. Here's the inside title sheet. The table of contents. I just, I appreciated the design. It looks good. When you read the table of contents, it looks like it covers a lot. She packs a lot in this book, but I will say that it's interesting that it's called Candle Magic, but as you read the first, maybe one third of the book, it reads more like it's a book about fire magic, which is broader than Candle Magic, obviously, and so I felt a little confused about that. Like it really should have been a book about fire magic, I feel. But the title is Candle Magic. I had a hard time with some parts of this book and this is what, one of the things I had. I'm just gonna try to list them out for you and see where it goes. It's not an easy read. There are places in which her writing feels overplotted, more words than necessary, over verbose for the sake of almost sounding more complicated than necessary for whatever reason. So I don't, I didn't feel like it was an accessible book. It didn't really transmute information or trans, translate information in a way that was easily digestible, particularly for beginners. So there was that. It was, it just, it felt like I needed to chew through it and try to like eliminate extra words to kind of get down to like what her point was. It was just, it was work. It was work. I didn't really enjoy that part of it. And I felt that a lot of the verbosity was just unnecessary. She uses footnotes. A lot of footnotes go on in on each page. And for the most part, I appreciate that because it's always a little extra note of explanation, either of the resource that the, uh, the information in the top body came from or an added note that doesn't necessarily make sense for um, for the narrative that's going on on the page, right? But often she uses footnotes as a way to market and plug her other books. So she'll talk about maybe a type of magic or a spell and she won't actually explain it in this book at all, even though the book is literally about that kind of spell. And instead she'll have a footnote that says, for more on this spell or for the rest of the information, it's almost as if she's saying for the rest of the information on this spell, you have to buy my other book. That bothered me because you're literally writing a book about this thing, explain it in the book. 
didn't like it. It was annoying and it happened a lot. And I was like, girl, come on, you gotta stop. So there's that. Last week in the book review that we talked about, I mentioned the necessity for critical thinking when you read books. Remember, and this is an important point because this is an issue in this book. Remember that people who call themselves witches may not necessarily adhere to the same tenets that you do. Witchcraft is a broad label for many, many, many different practices, for many, many different traditions, for many, many different cultures and derivatives. There are cultures in this world where I, as a Western woman from the United States of America, would look at their practices from the outside and say, that's totally witchcraft. But they would not call themselves witches at all. And there needs to be a broader understanding and picture holding of all of us across the globe and how we either identify differently or we come from different walks of life. We approach magic and connection to nature and what might look like broad paganism from different angles and different lenses. There needs to be a sensitivity to that. We cannot go around assuming that if you call yourself a witch, that your witchcraft is gonna look exactly like my witchcraft. You can't make that assumption. And in a lot of instances, the people making that assumption are white Westerners who do a lot of misappropriating. This is an important topic because there are a lot of statements in this book that make assumptions that are completely and categorically false. So often she'll use a word that I've never heard of before and say, this is a witch word for this particular concept. And it's like, it's not a witch word because it's not my witch word. And it's certainly not a witch word for any of the witches that I know. And it may be a witch word for her group and her coven, but you can't make these assumptions. And she does that throughout the book that if you are a witch, you know this concept. If you are a witch, this is the word you use, and that's just not true. And I feel that books that make broad blanket assumptions that way can be a little misleading and dangerous. We don't want to perpetuate that idea in the world. We wanna keep in mind and be sensitive to the fact that we are all very different. We all approach the sacred, we all approach nature, we all approach magic in a very different way from very different contexts. And to say, well, if I'm this way, then you need to be this way, is a very dangerous territory to wander into. It bothered me. And I find that it's something problematic to this book, especially if you are new and you wanna learn something. It gives you a lens that is problematic. It just is problematic. And it is entitled and privileged in a way that can be dangerous. I come from a particular lens that to shame people or to categorize parts of our body or our bodily processes as wrong is damaging and wounding. And there were a couple of comments. I want to actually quote this because I think that this is an important thing to bring up because you guys, I need glasses and I'm not using them. And so hold on because I'm going to squint and you're going to watch me squint. Hold on. Okay, so this is a footnote. No witches worth their salt would risk offending the spirit of the element by using their profane breath to extinguish pure fire. Instead, we use a ceremonial metal candle sniffer. All right, well, here's the thing. There are witches out there who think that to blow out a candle that you're using for a spell is to sort of like you're blowing away the intention, you're blowing away the power, and you are disrespecting the intention of the, of the spell. I don't really adhere to that. I think that it depends on what you're doing, and sometimes your breath can have a specific type of energetic working, and so you might want to make a distinct choice between should I blow out this candle or should I snuff it for now to come back and relight it. There's nothing wrong with your breath. There's nothing profane about your breath. I have an issue with this because I feel that, again, energetically, there are nuances to how you would choose to turn off a candle or to snuff a candle or to put out the flame. And it would be more beneficial for the reader to have an understanding of what those nuances are. And at no point is my breath profane right? Your breath is inspiration. Your breath gives you life. Your breath is holy. I literally wrote, there is nothing wrong with my breath in the, um, in the margins. Anyway, I find this problematic. There are a lot of these statements that push my buttons. I, I don't often deal in absolutes. I do think that sometimes absolutes are necessary when you're conveying information, but not these kinds of absolutes. Not all witches use the same words. Nothing about our bodies and who we are and nature and what creation is is profane. It really isn't. And so I think that the messaging is problematic. You're going to hear me say the word problematic a lot. 
you need to use a lot of critical thinking while reading this book because there are things like that that if you just gloss over they kind of embed themselves in your brain and you may not think that they're important or you might not think that you believe that way and so you don't give it a whole lot of thought even though you don't agree with it but if you don't actively like read it and literally just say that's not true i feel like it creates an influence on our subconscious that we later have to weed ourselves out of. All right, let me keep going because there's so many notes. I honestly, I wanted to write like a little outline for myself to share those thoughts with you and I, there were just so many that I had to trash it and wing it. I feel like I always do better when I wing it, but maybe I don't. You guys can be the, des the deciders on that, right? So a witch word meaning supper, she says, is scoper. I've never heard the word scoper before. It's a word and it can mean supper to some people, but I've never heard it. So if I were new, I'd be like, oh, I didn't know. I need to like start using this word. It may not be a word that's part of your lexicon. It may not be a word that's part of your regional dialect. It may not be a word that you need to use. Not all witches use these words. So there's that. I've already talked about that. I don't need to talk about it again. This is solely my, my opinion, my way of trying to approach things. There is some negative opinions about Christians in this book. And I get it. I, a lot of people in this community have a hard time with the fact that we were persecuted for a very long time and in a lot of ways we're still persecuted today, particularly from this religious corner of the world. But I find it a little unprofessional to kind of let that seep in into the dialogue of magic because you're really just talking about magic, fire magic, candle magic. There's no reason to put other people down. That shows up a little bit in this book. In one of the reviews that I found um, digging through the internet, it's someone commented, and I don't know how true this is or not, but that this writer had a particularly difficult upbringing in that religion. I totally appreciate that. A lot of us come from that space. But if you're gonna write a book from the stance of a teacher, I think that your own personal biases need to, and maybe I'm wrong, I just felt that we don't need to put that out there. If you focus on the magic, if you focus on what you're trying to teach, your internal bitterness over this particular group of people may not necessarily have a place in this book. I think that my opinion might be a little controversial there, but I don't want to be sludged by that, right? So there's that. Here's what's interesting. So I'm just now going off of like my questions. She makes a comment. Here's what she says. I included the traditional Celine salute to the moon in the goodly spell book, which is the other book that she wrote that I sent out in the box, which is just another way where she actually just kind of pitches all her other books. And it's important. I didn't read up until that point her identifying what her coven practices were. She is a, a Wiccan. She's Wiccan. She's a Gardnerian Wiccan. And I think I got that information by reading something else about them. So it's important that when you read this that you know that it's coming from that perspective. It's not specifically stated at the beginning, which I think would be really helpful for beginners so that you understand that you're seeing her magic through that lens. Gardnerian Wicca, which is Gerald Gardner is sort of considered the father of Wicca. And Wicca for him was kind of this amalgamation of different European traditions and pagan practices that he kind of coalesced into this body of this tradition, which is something also to keep in mind because this is pulling from different traditions. She pulls a lot of Greek words in her invocations that are that are generally really hard to pronounce. This is the second book that I've read that incorporates this languaging in their spell work. It's supposed to be really powerful, but it's also really challenging to pronounce unless you know Greek, which for me makes the spells in this book a little inaccessible for people who are beginners. And what's different in this book than perhaps in the book that I just read, which was The Sorcerer's Secret by Jason Miller last week, these invocations have a lot of Greek words. So everything in caps, I don't know if you can see it right there. Everything in caps is in Greek. It's hard to take this invocation and replace it with your own names for your own deities that you personally work with because these are just so much, there's so many words and it's not just the names of, of deities. Whereas with the book that I talked about last week, uh, The Sorcerer's Secret, he only uses the deity's name, which you can then kind of replace and work with. So it's a little bit of a harder workaround in terms of her spells if you don't want to do them exactly the way she shares. Uh, what else? What else? What else? I just, I feel like there are things in this book that are helpful. There are things in this book that you can learn from. Absolutely. It's not like it's all bad. It's not. There are spells here that if you're able to kind of parse through the problematic stuff, 
you can use for yourself. You can apply to your own practices. You can certainly apply to your own traditional lens. You have to kind of weed through a lot, in my personal opinion. I don't know that this is a book I would recommend. There are other books that do this, that address fire magic, candle magic in a much more accessible, clear way. And again, like I said in the beginning, she tends to be hyper verbose about things that she doesn't really need to be. That's it. For those of you who got the book in the December box, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on the book. I didn't finish the book. There's my admission. Like I got like more than 80% through and then I was just like, I don't, it just felt like so much work. That's what it felt like. It felt like a lot of work and it was perhaps work that I was creating for myself because I had such a hard time with so much of what she was saying. If you are someone who doesn't have a hard time with what she was saying, then maybe it'll be easier for you, but I just stopped. I just felt like it wasn't the best use of my time and that I can tell you what I thought about the book without finishing the whole thing. Certainly getting through 80% of the book gave me enough of an idea of what I was dealing with to talk to you about it. There is information that's helpful. I don't recommend it. I think that there are other books that do this better and I would love to hear what your thoughts are if you have read it. It is Candle Magic by Lady Passion, High Priestess of Coven, Alden Wild. There it is. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys think or not. <laughs> and next week we'll be covering something a little different, which I'm really excited about. I will talk to you all later. I hope that you have a wonderful magical week and we will see each other soon. Bye.